Il est professeur à l'Université Technique et Éco Santa Maria de Valparaiso, au Chili. So, uh, Mauricio has done his PhD in France. He is an astronomical designer. So, from Jose and Jose for astronomy. And so, it's a pleasure to have him here today. He also works on side projects uh, like um, uh, data analysis, data analysis of cloud services based on, uh, based on uh, Docker and, uh, and stuff like that. And also, um, Uh, Jupiter has some libraries which are common tools to uh, share methods and things to analyze the so Today is going to talk about uh, structure characterization and compact representation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I'm a computer scientist, so probably I will make mistakes about astronomy, uh, so be patient. <laughs> With me, also I speak French, uh, so I can uh, answer questions in, in French, and you can uh, ask in French if you want. Okay. Um, I will talk about structure ca characterization and compact representation in astronomical hyperspectral images or um, in uh, cubes of data. But first, I want to give you a little bit introduction about me that already. Uh, told and a little bit on the projects that I am working. So um, I'm an assistant professor since January of this uh, year in an electronics department in Santa Maria and I am part of the um, uh, of several centers including uh, the Chilean Cop Telescope Array Consortium and the Pattern Recognition Association in Chile and my research are, uh, areas are data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, and astroinformatics and astro engineering as an application of these techniques um, including uh, applying all these to distributed systems and large um, uh, large data systems um, and specifically in, in more what I do in theoretical research in computer sciences, reinforcement learning, micro decision processes and information theory and the theory complexity in general. Um, I have some uh, easy couples articles uh, and uh, a lot of small ABS NASA articles like uh, the ones you can mm -hmm. present in ADAS or some, uh, things like that to this point. So my formation is just uh, in computer science, so both in the masters and, and, and the PhD, uh, but I have been involved in astronomy uh, research for already more than 10 years, 14 years ago. So uh, I will like to introduce you basically the, the research lines that are in different colors, uh, but today we will talk about these ones. So um, here in blue, we can see the research on infrastructure that we have done for the Chilean Virtual Observatory that uh, means basically um, picking the, uh, the standards and architecture that the um, IBOA produces uh, with the stuff that it's uh, for the Chilean Virtual Observatory in order to uh, publish ALMA data and other data generated in Chile in a standard format uh, using the VO standards. Uh, due to the same reason, we have to um, manage infrastructure, so we have a couple of, of uh, supercomputers that we have to manage and make all the infrastructure in order to work and co put everything together with cloud systems right now and put uh, um, an infrastructure that can be used for research. And in the same line we have uh, like the Jupyter notebooks running online that can be used for high performance computing uh, to do things like this which is processing uh, the whole um, uh, a whole data set of uh, a lot of ALMA fixed cubes and to produce basic statistics about them. So it's processing a, a lot of terabytes of information to produce this. Okay, so this is like the research in the infrastructure area. Um, I also work in time domain, like uh, um, what is very popular in, in machine learning uh, for astronomy is to work with um, time series and specifically with light curves and um, we're working here in trying to find this is um, 
this is the period of um, a variable star and here we have the, um, the intensity. So we're trying to see what happens in the long period, like several years, 10 years, uh, and see which are the different types of variability on the stars that are there. And we want a machine to tell us which is the uh, clustering, which are the different types of uh, variability that we find in stars with long period. Um, other project is picking the uh, Kepler data um, to find in exoplanets and um, use a machine learning algorithm, which is very uh, known right now, which are uh, convolutional neural networks, in order to obtain from directly the observations the same parameters that uh, astronomers have obtained by hand and try to replicate this in order to apply um, this um, algorithms to uh, other uh, other data sets that are not the Kepler uh, database. Uh, we also are trying to make clusters of different stars that have um, a variability on the whole spectra and try to characterize that. It's a much more newer project. So all of these are in the time domain. So today I want to talk to you about uh, this other domain, which is basically structure detection and regional interest detection. And um, what I want to talk here is a few contributions that we have made uh, in this line. Uh, for instance, this is for um, regional interest detection, uh, similar to uh, sex, sex structure, but um, using a multi-scale representation. Uh, the same idea, a little bit more uh, advanced with wavelets um, uh, the representations that uh, put me in contact with uh, with here which is uh, the bubble clumps representation I will talk a little bit more about this and a much more recent work in uh, representations so uh, first I guess everybody knows this but uh, here uh, we're talking about hyperspectral images or uh, data cubes that have that has um, retransmission declination and also velocity or uh, in general frequencies. Yeah? So we have several channels of frequencies. I work with data obtained from the ALM Observatory, uh, even though um, all the techniques could be applied to any uh, radio inter interferometer or actually um, going to other wavelengths. But uh, for me, as a computer scientist, I see the same cube just as um, solid cube of intensities, okay? And a uh, three-dimensional array of <coughs> intensities. So I tried to use this uh, idea to um, work with data. The first thing that I want to, um, to explain is a little bit how I assess the results that I have. Um, even though in the papers I tried to use uh, real data, uh, internally I tried to use um, just synthetic data to verify <coughs> if what I'm doing gives the correct answer before trying with um, real data. Uh, and uh, for that, I've been the simulator that's called ACIDO or a synthetic data generator that uh, keep uh, peak, um, peak emission lines uh, from uh, Splatalog or any uh, molecular database and generates basically um, using certain model for the emission lines, uh, the local radio velocity gradients, uh, some uh, corrections due to the red chip, and some broadening functions. We try to represent simple uh, structures like uh, a couple of Gaussians, a couple of, uh, of circles. Um, as a synthetic model in order to compare them with what we obtain as a detection. So we generate the, the, the functions in order to uh, test them later. So we can have a Gaussian line profile like this one and what the simulator do is to uh, basically factorize um, the intensity maps as uh, certain functions, um, the local molecular red chip maps and uh, the broadening maps. So with that, we produce, oh, we produce from a, a concept of a universe <laughs> and then a concept of, of, of a telescope, 
uh, we produce this type of uh, results similar to what uh, a Fitz Alma uh, file looks like. Okay. So the idea here is basically um, produce the spectral lines and then uh, putting that into um, certain functions that looks like this uh, in each slice and then with that we produce this data here. And as we know the specific lines of the specific structure, we can uh, recover the same structure and see if the algorithms work correctly. Okay, so let's talk about the, these four contributions that we have made. Well, this contribution was a small contribution in an ADAS conference in 2014, but um, it had been very useful to assess my results. Um, Okay, so let's start with the region of interest. The first thing that we have tried is to say, let's try to uh, reduce the dimensionality of what we are observing by selecting a region of uh, interest. And for that, we uh, built up a pipeline that makes some uh, spectral processing uh, by uh, using morphological operators um, and try to <coughs> get a sketch uh, probabilistically of the uh, spectral lines, yeah, of the broadening. And with that we have um, um, estimation in the, uh, in the velocity where the signal is. And with, the, uh, with that we stack all the slices and, and then do a multi-scale uh, segmentation using morphological operators. What is that? It's basically... Um, so. Yeah, I have support for this. So <laughs> we, we do the spectral processing by uh, trying to get um, a sample of this and get when uh, this curve gets saturated and then we said that this is enough. Um, uh, so we select a few slides and then uh, do the uh, spectral field uh, extraction to know which is the velocity field that we are working on and then we make a multi-scale segmentation by picking um, like squares here and apply uh, a few morphological operators that convert all this uh, square into one single value. And if you do that for several uh, different scales here, you have um, small detections or large detections. And with that, we make an object indexing. So we pick each object and try to see if this object is uh, in the same pixels as the uh, larger one. And if it's in the same pixel as the larger one, we say that it's the same, um, the same object. Okay? If not, then it's a different object. And this way we can have um, uh, a different sizes, different scales, and um, a connected version of this, um, of this detection at different levels and this allows you to go inside and see uh, how it works. Okay, And the good thing is that this is not a very uh, uh, advanced algorithm, it is a very basic algorithm and that is a good thing because we can divide this automatically by just putting the code in, uh, in a program and uh, run this for, for instance, all the fit files of cycle 0 and 1, I think it was, uh, in, at the same time, in order to put it in a supercomputer and compute the, this region of interest for all the ALMA data set. So we're talking about uh, several terabytes of data that we have to process. And we here, we cannot see it very good, uh, but here we have like the um, uh, different uh, values for each of the region of interest. Uh, so you have uh, central uh, right ascension, declination, uh, get um, major axis length, minor axis length, the area, the eccentricity, the, eccentricity, the solidity, etc. Okay. Um, so the good thing is that we end up from a terabyte of data with uh, a catalog that tells me where the signals of each alma fit file is. Okay, so we can end up with things like this, uh, where here you have the area of, um, of the region of interest, and here you have 
the um, uh, intensity uh, in, in James Keeper beam and uh, here you have all the observations of Alma and looks that way. I'm not an astronomer so I do not know why this has this form and why you have these large intensities here in large areas separated but uh, it's interesting to see that this is the values that uh, have been observed in Alma. And here you have the whole sky, representation declination, and um, here you have the intensity of each observation. So you can see probably something like the Milky Way here. Okay, uh, as I told before, uh, we did all this in Jupyter Notebooks in a data center, so we can see that this is a more friendly way to move the processing and analysis where the data is in the data center and not uh, in the astronomy computer. Yeah, and that's uh, one of the side projects that we have. Another different way of looking at this same problem is to do the multi-scale um, the multi-scale analysis using um, the mathematical tools that are available, like uh, wavelet decomposition. Uh, wavelet decomposition, for those that do not know, are, it's like similar to the Fourier decomposition, um, but um, here you have a certain uh, scale that moves. So it's for non-stationary signals. You you have Fourier decomposition for stationary signals that work very well. Uh, it can decompose any signal for a different um, decomposition, but the wavelet decomposition is more tailored for um, non-stationary signals. So in case of uh, astronomy, you have uh, a star or whatever or standard source, uh, it looks much more uh, like a non-stationary signal. So um, we use the um, discrete wavelet transform to produce uh, uh, different scale representations of the, um, the same elements. Uh, and with that, we use a, a known algorithm for uh, finding uh, clumps in molecular clouds, like clump find. And we try to contour uh, the detection at each level. And uh, this work, unfortunately, end up just working in two dimensions because, uh, unfortunately, the student uh, uh, passed away, so we uh, did not finish this work. But we pick uh, his ideas and continue in other uh, work that I will show. So this is basically um, the first part, which is just working with pixels. There is no um, no very novel thing in this uh, uh, idea, but was our introduction to the field. Um, I want to talk much more in detail about these representations uh, that it's called bubble clumps. So uh, if, once, if you see the, um, uh, the work that has been done for uh, detecting structure in molecular clouds or even in galaxies, you will see things like clumping algorithms, trying to detect clumps in um, not only just in an image but in the data cube. And um, you may generate the region of interest, but you want to generate also velocity maps and uh, probably tables uh, of, of clumps to make catalogs. And um, I've just realized when I see the algorithms that this is very similar to what in machine learning we call clustering. But it's not exactly the same. So the question is how we can apply clustering algorithms to uh, this problem. And for that, uh, if we see the clamping methods are, are more popular, um, now there is another one that's called CPROP. Um, we have the ancient Gauss, Gauss clamp that basically assumes that each uh, clamp is a, have a, has a Gaussian shape, uh, and this is a strong assumption. Yeah. So it, it works fine if you know that your clamps have a Gaussian shape, and it's, I think, al almost not the always not the case. Clump find works in terms of pixels. So you just um, try to separate things by putting a threshold <coughs> and going uh, down in the algorithm. And when you see that you have uh, different values, then you open a new clump and then you separate uh, things in this way. But you do it in three dimensions. And this algorithm um, 
is very sensitive to parameters, uh, but uh, it's very used, at least in molecular clouds. That's what I've seen. Um, and, I, and the problem is that it assigns one pixel to one clump, and uh, it's very topological uh, on, the, on the structure, and it doesn't uh, get any fractal representations or any hierarchical representations of the data. So a completely different algorithm was dendrograms, uh, like uh, 10 years ago, where um, the idea now is to represent like the peaks of the, of the data um, and connect them in order to uh, produce different groups that are hierarchically connected and not only um, uh, like topologi topo topologically connected. So you can uh, understand more how things evolve or have, has been generated with algorithms like dendrograms. And um, we have much more holistic ways to do this also, faster way like Fog Walker, which is an algorithm that uh, actually uses gradient descent or uh, heat climbing as you want to, to present it in order to uh, generate a separate group similar to ClamFind. Uh, it's a little bit more robust than ClamFind, but I think it, it hasn't get that tension that it needs. It's, it's a quite good algorithm, but not very popular. So, um, Gauss Clam, in my opinion, is well motivated, but the problem is that it's too complex. It uh, has too many parameters. I think it's more than 32 parameters to tune up, and they do not translate to physics at all. Uh, the, all the parameters are algorithmic um, choices that you have to make, so it's difficult to, to tune. Um, and it's good to make some uh, region of en uh, interest selection uh, and may be good for estimations if uh, your clumps are actually Gaussian, but um, it's not a simple algorithm. Can find on the other way, it's simple, uh, no model uh, behind. Um, Fellow worker, for instance, is not as simple as clump find. Uh, but the problem is that only selects um, the region of interest, then you have to check this region of interest if you want to estimate the flux or estimate uh, whatever you want, the velocity or the gradient. Um, a dendrofind is hierarchical, but uh, again, has no model. It's not very flexible. You just put the whatever the parameters are and it's not allow you to make different uh, sign cases for this and also uh, do not allow you to get estimation. So the idea, um, the idea was to try to pick the best ideas of each one and put it together and new algorithms. The first thing that we have tried is to use the same idea of using wavelets, but uh, now uh, in order to make an estimation. So we build up um, a mother wavelet in three dimensions uh, that allows allow us to um, uh, estimate the different uh, parts of the in, in multi-scale uh, analysis, uh, the different parts of a molecular cloud, and um, try to um, get the connections between uh, large-scale structures with uh, small-scale structures. Okay. Um, this had a few results, but we abandoned that because the wavelet transformation was uh, too expensive, it was a slow algorithm, and it was not very easy to uh, interpret, has not very good extensibility. So we, we tried to simplify our model, and uh, we ended up with this bubble comes idea. This idea is very simple. We can approximate a cube where x uh, are the, um, the three coordinates here with a set of parameters plus a Gaussian noise. Uh, we assume that the noise is Gaussian here. And then we uh, can approximate that with a, a series of um, continuous functions where each function is the same. So we call that a kernel. Um, and the kernel might, uh, must have certain properties, yeah? like being between 0 and 1 and other mathematical properties. And uh, we put here um, a parameter, which is the size of, of this, uh, uh, which is the intensity, let's say, of, the, of each one of these functions. And we started with a very simple idea. It's just consider that this um, alpha is constant for every value. 
Okay, one might say this is a very bad idea, but actually uh, it, it gets very interesting. Um, as we have uh, here a um, certain error, um, certain noise, uh, that it's modeled as a Gaussian, we can construct this uh, as a uh, typical um, maximum likelihood uh, optimization problem and we end up with the least squared problem between basically the, um, the, real, uh, the real cube and our estimation, uh, but constrained to certain, um, uh, to certain characteristics. And in this case, what we want is to estimate the flux always below the real value that we can find in the pixels. And this is very important because if you leave these functions alone, then you will have uh, like a, a not real flux in uh, our estimations. Okay, so uh, we always underestimate the, the flux in this representation. Um, and this can be uh, obtained by uh, updating an energy matrix that allows you to subtract this let's say bubbles, which is the, um, um, these Gaussians that have the same, the same structure. Um, and we have an algorithm here in order to update this, um, this energy efficiently. So we iteratively get with this other algorithm all the um, small Gaussians from here in order to end up with a representation like this. Okay, so each Gaussian there, each function that could, could be any function, but let's say Gaussian, um, represent part of the cube, not in the pixel domain, but in the continuous domain. And each one of these ones are equal, okay? The good thing about being equal is that it can be in, um, interpreted as a independent and identically distributed uh, sample of the image. So this representation, it's like sampling the image, but um, each sample is independent and each sam sample is identically distributed. And that's the major requirement of uh, machine learning algorithms in order to be applied. So uh, as I've said, well, we have a few theorems uh, on, on how this error will be bounded, but uh, we can select uh, a function that makes this uh, bound much more, um, much, much lower. And um, these are basically Gaussian functions. So we end up with Gaussian functions with, um, with a compact support. Okay, so let's go to data. This was too theoretic, theoretical to this point. Um, here we have uh, four cubes from the Alma Science Verification um, data set. Uh, with which are small cubes, so we have uh, a few uh, a few hundred pixels for um, for each uh, rate of section declination uh, frequencies and uh, sorry frequencies uh, um, dimensions, and for the frequencies we have uh, at most 500. Okay, but this means that we have this amount of pixels to store, and um, here. Other, other data like the angular resolution, the beam size uh, resolution, etc. Okay, uh, we have selected these four cubes, which are Orion um, um, uh, M100, uh, Grand Design Galaxy. Uh, here you have a protoplanet LED disk and um, a binary system. Okay, so uh, this algorithm that I have shown you uh, needs an estimation of the signal to noise ratio. And for that, um, we pick the um, RMS and try to find uh, the point where if you cut a different um, RMS multipliers, then if you cut the image there, then you will start having a lot of noise first. And in some point, this will have this inflection point. This is the derivative some inflection point and you will pass to the signal. So this point is an heuristic for finding where uh, you do not have, uh, where the, the signal begins to mix with the noise, if you want, okay? 
and um, with this we have this new representation so this is the original image stacked and here we have our representation and here we have re the residual you might think that the residual is not very good but uh, we can filter the the error that it's uh, produced uh, over here because we have overestimated uh, the values over here um, later as we will see okay so we have explained a little bit how this works, how much time we have, yeah. Uh, but we haven't talked about why we want to try to do this. And the basic idea of this is uh, try to compact this huge cube of data into a much more simpler representation that can be used for analysis. So um, here is the concept that you might compress uh, a cube in a, zip in a zip file in order to uh, bring it to your home. Uh, but that car is completely useless in this point. Yeah? A, compact, a compressed car is completely useless. What we are trying to do here is a compact representation, not a compressed representation, which is the same functionality like a car, like a large car, but um, in, a, uh, in a small way that uh, it's not the same, you will have not the same power as the original uh, car, so you will not have the same power than the original data, but um, it could be used to make some simple analysis, at least. Okay. So, here if you see, we have a representation using the, this algorithm that it's, uh, for this image, 1.7% of the original size that we have and these other ones that are much more um, much more condensed uh, signals we can see that we have 0.1% of the size and 0.1-0.3% of the size so um, we can produce in a reasonable time, this is a couple of minutes um, in a reasonable time we can obtain a good representation that will uh, be useful for analysis, that can be uh, applied al machine algorithms uh, over it, and, um, uh, and that actually looks like uh, it has the content itself, which is this one over here. So let's look a few ideas. So, oh, here is the spectrum. Yeah. So remember that this is a cube, so we can obtain here the, the spectra of the, um, of the line, so 0, 1, 0. Um, and uh, you can see that the, the spectra here um, can represent a little bit the, the content. Okay. So let's talk a bit uh, about what are the applications of this uh, representation. For instance, here we have a vertical decomposition of equal flux to each of these images. So we picked this original image, we have this uh, compact representation of 1.7% of, um, of the original size, and then we um, just pick the top one uh, Gaussians, the top one uh, element, and produce this image. And this image is have the same flux that this other image but um, uh, a little bit more uh, distributed. So if you sum all of these images, you will produce exactly the same uh, function. This is uh, very easy to do with this representation. That's what I call a vertical decomposition. Well, it might be used for science, I'm not sure how, but uh, it's just to show that uh, it is, uh, uh, you can do that, okay? So, but uh, let's go to learning. Uh, what you can do also with the representation is to actually apply clustering algorithms. In machine learning, you have several clustering algorithms uh, like k-means, uh, db-scan, hierarchical clustering, um, agglomerative clustering, and these are very good uh, algorithms. This, in this case, we have uh, spectral clustering, which is one of the most expensive algorithms but due to the low dimensionality of the uh, representation, you can uh, produce this type of clustering. So what's the main difference between uh, a normal clump uh, detection 
from this um, uh, clustering. The first thing is that you can see that clusters are overlapped. Um, usually, in pixel-based algorithms like like ClamFind, you uh, assign one pixel to one clump. Here, as you can do this vertical um, uh, this vertical decomposition, you can assign a few of the bubbles to one cluster and a few of the bubbles to the other. And that allows you to represent blended sources or bl blended emissions. Okay? Uh, if it's a good separation or not, it will depend on the, um, uh, the science goals that you have and also the parameters that you use. But the, the thing is that this representation allows you to use these algorithms and uh, produce these kind of results. Um, let's see the case of the um, uh, protoplanetary disk. Here, as I said before, um, we, produce, we, we produce here a um, representation that, if you see here, has a lot of different clusters. So we have a main cluster, that is actually the disk, um, and a lot of, let's say, noise. So you can clusterize this actually using mean shift clustering, another algorithm uh, that you can select. It could be k-means or it could be uh, db-scan, it doesn't matter um, in this case. And we just say that everything that it's not this huge one, it's basically noise. So it's noise that we pass from the regional uh, data to this representation. So now we can filter this and just keep this um, this single structure. Here we have um, the structure in right ascension declination and in the other dimension here and then the other dimension here we have frequency. So you can see, sorry, in the other dimension here and here. So you can see that the um, velocity goes the, the, the two ways from uh, the center, okay? And later, just selecting these groups over here, just the purple one, we can make something like a, a self-organizing map, which is um, um, machine learning uh, neural network uh, algorithm that allows you to learn the uh, manifold where this data uh, lives. So basically here, with a few neurons, with a few points, we are representing with this um, mesh the structure in terms of uh, velocity and the ascension declination in a single in a single image, with only a few points here that but they are connected. Okay, so this could be useful to knowing how the structure of the disk uh, is working. Other idea is, for instance, galaxy morphology. Um, you can pick this M100 galaxy, do some cleaning similar to the other uh, idea. We just make a clustering of several of these uh, Gaussian functions and then um, keep only those that look like arms and then separate this into different parts. Okay? And here you have the predictions for the uh, frequency. So uh, remember this always it's a cube, this is not uh, an image. And then we can have this gravity uh, schematic where we represent for each one of these clusters um, the, just the total flux, which is the size of this, um, of this point, uh, the radial velocity, which is the color. So if you have a cold color, then um, it's uh, uh, it's going yeah relatively to the center. It's it's um, a negative velocity, let's say, and here you have a positive velocity. Yeah, so we can see that um, this galaxy, uh, these points are going far away, and this goes a near away from for us. Uh, so we can estimate how how this is is going. And these uh, lines are like, uh, let's say, the gravity between them. Uh, it's just to connect the points, uh, depending on, the, on, on their values. And you can use this very, very low um, 
representation, which, which is just points with a certain um, estimation of the of the intensity of the mass that you are you have in here and the velocity in order to feed up an n-body simulation, for instance, and start a simulation from real data. Initialize a simulation from re real data. Another application, it's um, truth detection and light detection. Yeah. Here you have, uh, again, these two sources, and you might want to cluster things, but now if you see the clusters are not in the space, but more in the, in the focus in the velocities. So then you can um, separate the both sources and try to um, match each one of these lines with uh, a spectral line, yeah? in order to know the composition of, uh, and the abundance of each of the elements that have this, uh, these sources. The good thing about this is that then you can do uh, use use uh, um, uh, data fusion fusion uh, data fusion fusion yeah fusion sorry data fusion algorithms like this which is a moment preserving uh, algorithm in order to produce um, a catalog of the different um, lines that you find. So here you can see where they are in, in the uh, right ascension and declination, but where they are in, in frequency, and uh, also having not only the lines, but the shape of the line, okay, in the space. So you have the major semi-axis, the minor semi-axis, the angle which is uh, rotated here, the full width that have maximum, uh, and actually the gradient of the um, velocity in terms of the space. Okay, so you can obtain all this information uh, just from this clustering. Okay, so that was um, uh, this idea I didn't show, but uh, we will have well, other clustering uh, that is possible. A much more recent um, contribution was the HDM cloud. Uh, which is a specific algorithm for um, uh, molecular clouds, but uh, I think it can be applied to other things also. Okay. Um, well, this paper, sorry, it was presented in, um, it, it is published in Astronomy Computing, and this paper is presented in uh, MRAS. Okay. So, the Gaussian mixture reduction idea uh, is that we will try right now to not assuming that uh, each Gaussian that we will uh, subtract from the signal it's of the same size but we will construct an optimization problem of, for this so for that we uh, select um, some points it gets quite large to explain how you can select these points but um, the basic idea is to have a, an homogeneous representation, but weighted by the um, but by the flux. So we have all these points, which are the center points of uh, of the Gaussians that we will use. Um, you have some collocation points, which are the points where we will evaluate uh, the quality of our representation, and some boundary points that will tell us. Um, which are the limits of uh, our uh, optimization. And with that, we, um, we have a variational approach which, which minimizes the, um, uh, the difference. Basically, the it maximizes the similarity between uh, the real data and our model, but also have some dom domain, construction, uh, domain uh, constraints like uh, not having uh, more flux than the original image and uh, a few other positivity constraints. Um, and what we do here is basically assuming again that we have a Gaussian function but with um, an almost arbitrary um, uh, covariance and obviously uh, any position that we want and also um, not 
the same weight for every, every uh, Gaussian, but uh, a different weight for each one. And uh, with that, we can optimize using uh, normal nonlinear uh, optimization algorithms, uh, based most of them on the Newton method, um, like Leverman McQuart, for instance. And um, we generate synthetic data and try to uh, see how these Gaussians uh, look like in our reconstruction of the of the element. <coughs> okay, so how this representation works? We have a lot of Gaussians after the optimization, but they are not connected at all. And each Gaussian do not represent anything. It does, does, does not represent a, a source, uh, any physical quantity. It's just a representation of the cube that we have. Then to give some representation, what we <coughs> do is to do something similar to um, what uh, hierarchical clustering do, uh, does, uh, which is having a measure for comparing these Gaussians and if they are similar, then we put it together in a new Gaussian, okay? So we, we agglomerate things um, based on the similarity of the moments. As, uh, there are Gaussians, we compare the uh, mixed Gaussian compared to the sum of the two other Gaussians, which are here, uh, and that way we can produce a new uh, Gaussian with different weight, different mean value and different covariance matrix, and we compare them to see uh, how they work. And we do that iteratively to produce this hierarchy of elements. So in the end, we end up with the these same Gaussians that are, uh, here we have um, plotted the, um, um, the, um, uh, the limits of these Gaussians, uh, the level, curve level, uh, I think in, in, in English, yeah, the curve, the, the curve level. And the good thing about this is that we can cut and we can cut this whether, whether we want. So uh, here we have the original one and here we have cut this here in two, okay? So here we have cut this in, in two, now we have a blue one and a, and a red one, okay? Uh, this is a schematic. Obviously, this uh, amount of Gaussians are much more. You have a thousand of Gaussians, but uh, you can start dividing your um, your structure in uh, different groups. And here, for instance, you have I don't know if you can see it correctly, but you have overlapped also um, structures. So again, going to um, continuous functions allows you to have um, overlap sums that allows you to represent more, in my opinion, uh, what the physical properties of these sums are, uh, and not only the pixel-based separation that uh, previous algorithms uh, provide. Uh, so here, as you can see, here is the result for the clump find, and here is the result from the Feldwalker algorithm. So um, here we said, okay, this is a clump rather than this one, and it's a little bit overlap with this one. So that do not make this sharp uh, structure here that probably do not exist at all. Okay, if we have a much more continuous uh, uh, representation. Um, and again, this representation is very fast to divide. So again, you can, um, if you are not happy with this, for instance, um, separation, you can, let's say, uh, double click this and it will divide it again uh, in, in two groups. Um, I think this tool will be very useful for making things uh, more closer to what uh, astronomy is, which is analysis. Uh, an algorithm like ClamFind just give you an answer and then uh, if you want to to have a, a different answer to see what is happening, you have to run the algorithm again. This representation, this hierarchical representations, are, are allow you to get different representation just by cutting the tree in different parts, similar to what uh, dendrograms uh, do. Okay. Um, these examples were in two dimensions. If you go with the uh, spectral um, domain, also you can do this. 
and then the separation depends a lot on um, where the velocity is. So you can find uh, certain structures that uh, are, are, are have different um, uh, spectrum than uh, the, the other, and that's why they are separated. So uh, this allows you to separate again, not only by uh, the spatial coordinates, but also the spectral coordinates. Okay, so these are the, um, uh, the research lines that I want to uh, explain a little bit today. So ACIDO, um, the um, uh, region of interest detection and uh, this structure de de detection. I just want to talk about, uh, very shortly about these new projects um, that are like the new stuff that I'm working. Uh, I'm working with the CTA Observatory in Gamma Reconstruction, which is basically trying to, uh, from the um, um, images that the um, atmospheric uh, telescopes, uh, how, how I, I don't remember, welcome to the, the imaging atmospheric telescopes uh, of, uh, that, of, of Terenkov, uh, the, the Terenkov effect. Um, produces, you can um, take the light from here and try to predict where the gamma ray uh, came from and uh, actually uh, um, try to know if it's uh, a gamma ray or another thing, an hadron, a muon, etc. So uh, what we are using here is uh, again um, uh, deep learning neural networks in order to um, produce a stereoscopic or several telescope prediction of where the gamma ray is uh, in terms of right ascension and declination and uh, the energy of the gamma, uh, ga gamma ray. Other things that we are doing is continuous synthesis, uh, which is basically using continuous functions rather than the fast Fourier transform to pass from the UV plane to, um, to images. So uh, it's basically another way of doing uh, synthesis um, and uh, what we will we present next week in uh, ADAS it's content aware search which is basically uh, not having only the, the virtual observatory to give you um, the metadata that someone has written in the data that you are searching but also going uh, deep into the data itself in order to uh, select certain a number of, uh, I don't know, flux um, window that you want or some other uh, uh, characteristics that are not in the metadata but are directly on the, uh, on the content of the image. So that's basically what it have. I have obviously a lot of other uh, <laughs> backup uh, slides but uh, probably I haven't explained everything very, very correctly, so I'm open to a, a lot of questions because I think that this is quite different from the field that you are used to, so. Yeah, uh, I completely agree with, with you. you the, the, the first, the, first, the fast Fourier transform and then the clean algorithm adds a lot of, of artifacts that are not really there, okay? So the, the main question that I ask to you to, it's which algorithm or which method you will use in the visibility. So that's the point. We have a lot of algorithms for images. 
As you see, CAMFIND, for instance, for detecting this, in, it's basically a segmentation algorithm that it's well studied and uh, we know which are the results. If you go to segment things in, in directly in visibilities, um, that will give you basically uh, the range of frequencies that you know but know the position. So uh, it's difficult to work uh, over there, I think. How you can select the source that you want if you have two sources, for instance. Yeah. Or just, and, and then we just fully transform it and we compare it to the visibilities and it's, of course it's an iterative process. But, so I wonder if there is a good reason when you want to do this kind of uh, algorithm to look for sources why why to work in the images because I think it's it's you can you can take a sky a synthetic sky and, and yeah. make the visibility. It's exactly the the bottom line between. That I haven't uh, said it, but the bottom line here of the, this whole uh, presentation is that I want to move the fitting process, where you want to fit something in order to put in your paper, um, the fitting process as into continuous functions as, f um, as early as possible. So that's it's basically, yes, my, my idea of working in this continuous synthesis to, to try to make the fitting into continuous function uh, as early as possible in the, in the visibilities and then make all the analysis in this world and not in the pixel based world with it's prone to a lot of um, systematic errors that uh, uh, are added so yes I think it's because it's more difficult to work uh, you have less tools to, to work in visibilities but I think it's the way that we should go <laughs> Well, this is the point. They are not in that group. What you measure are the visibilities, not the pixels. Yep. So the pixels are derived from the visibilities. The pixels are the representation of visibilities. But they are not a unique representation. That's the whole point. So the visibilities are like pixels are average visibilities. Yeah, they are interpolations. Yep. Interpolations of the of basically the so so the power you have in between different scales. Just one single reason. Is the from, from the computer science point of view, if you, if, if you had um, that the uh, interferometer has a regular grid, that makes no, no sense, a regular grid, then <laughs> yeah, it makes no sense, I, I don't know, I know, but if you have a regular grid, then you can have the fast Fourier transform without any uh, loss inf of information. Yeah. But as because of the instrument, we do not have that, then we are losing information due to uh, interpolation. So, so yes, uh, we're losing information, and that's why we have all these artifacts that appears in, and then yeah. we, we need something it's like clean. I know you have sparsity algorithm for right now, but are you going to represent sparse signal, like yeah. this kind of signal that is actually not in a regular grid? So, I was wondering how, I mean, I understand the data is huge because, of course, you have all the data, so hmm. uh, compared to a map where you have been basically reducing. But I, I really think, well, this is much more powerful if you manage to tame this. Yeah, but one of the reasons also is that most objects that you want to look at are compact in, in images in real space. In, in Fourier space, they are all the base. So the information is scattered over all the base images yeah. if you have a single object. And in, 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 in real space, it's located in a few pixels. So if you, need, if you need, for example, to segment your image to make it processable, then all the information will be in just a few segments in images, but not necessarily in visibilities. You have two objectives, they are separated in real space, not in visibilities. So no, but I think for compact sources, it makes sense what you're saying, mm. and actually that's why clean is working, because yeah. it's for compact sources, but uh, I don't think most astronomical if objects are compact. That's why but they don't fill your whole field. Yeah, no, no. Generally, sure. generally, yeah. sometimes yeah. it's Yeah, but actually, yeah, if you try to get extended sources like this one, it's, uh, it, 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 I think it, you start uh, having a lot of problems due to the password transfer.
Sorry. Yeah? Uh, when you make the column fine, do you succeed to go deeper than the uh, other method? And how do you have a cleaning? Uh, how do you do with the side of the when, when I do what? Sorry? How do you cope with the cleaning, the side of, and uh, do you succeed to go deep or do you just consider white sources? Yeah, that's, that's the, the new project we are working on that. Yeah, we, uh, we have a few results, but it's basically uh, showing that we can do better than the fast Fourier transform to this point. Uh, with certain parameters, which uh, again add more, more parameters, uh, and we haven't uh, seen how clean works over that to this point. Okay, so yeah, this is new stuff. <laughs> it's not uh, uh, much more. Yeah, I, I have two questions actually. One is that uh, this is most of the techniques that you show that are basically characterization of, of data sets, yeah. the properties of a single data set. So, one of the things that we are trying to do actually with the Alma Archive, we are trying to transform essentially the metadata from data from metadata that are uh, you know what you know before the observations to actually metadata that describe the content of the observation a posteriori. Mm. So a compact representation of what's inside the data so that people can actually search for content and not search for uh, yeah. so one of the sorry. things that I was <laughs> curious is whether you can use your uh, one of the segmentation algorithms, for example, for uh, automatic recognition of lines, uh, yeah. done this test, uh, and if it works. Because this is one of our major headaches that we have. We have different softwares that are trying to do this, but with different assumptions, and all of them work. Mm. So, yes, you can have like automatic detection of lines, but there is a combinatory problem that goes beyond this. Uh, I have worked on, on this a little bit, and the problem is uh, that then you have these these positions, and then you have to do the cross matching matching with Splatterlog, for instance. And you need to give certain parameter that, and that's arbitrary. So which is your uh, your cross matching? So you can do it at, as best as your uh, cross matching. Yeah, but in principle, I mean, the idea is that in principle you can then use. Uh, learning algorithms to know what type of things you should look based on yep. the type of, of a priori information on the source. So that would be actually interesting to look into. Yeah, actually that's, that's a good interest. thing about this uh, representation, that no. you, you pass through the other representation in order to produce this very fast. You do not need to, to make a, a very complex computation to obtain this. From the representation that it's already more compact than the original cube, you can um, you can filter as you want here in order to say say with your own criteria uh, which you consider what what do you consider a line? For instance, if it's not more than uh, certain fixes, it's not a line. If it's uh, not much for certain delta, the um, uh, the spectral line, it's not a line. Uh, it has a gradient more than something, this will be probably another thing. So you can filter over this. And it's a, uh, probably this number here, uh, well, here is a, a, the, the number of uh, elements. So you can transform this value into a flux. The problem with that is that um, probably it's not as precise as you can get from the original data, but it's, it's, not, the it's not the point. Exactly. Accuracy. Exactly. So. Yeah. Which is on the next level. I mean, I think scientifically, what we are now most interested in is not only understanding a single data set, but comparing uh, different patterns in different uh, in different data sets. And data sets might be theoretical in some. So basically, so can be what? Sorry. Theoretical, numerical uh, simulation, yeah. simulation typically. So one of the big problems that we have, for example, in the physics of the Testera medium is trying to match what we observe, the patterns that we observe, with the patterns that are different. And I was wondering whether yeah, any okay. of these algorithms could be used to derive some objective measure of these things. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, an, an, oh, another of the, oh, of the research lines that we are trying to, to explore. So, 
the good thing about pushing the fitting on the continuous world as fast as possible is that you will end up with a series of functions and you have function analysis to help you and you have uh, information theory to help you. In the, in, in the pixel level, you also have a little tools to do that, but it cannot uh, help you to do something like uh, accounting for the level of structure that the distribution of the, uh, of the signal has. So you can produce first um, a simulation, then get this representation, get the real data, get the same representation, and then compare with a metric like um, uh, the mutual information metric, for instance, the two representations in order to obtain a value that tells you how similar they are. And it will be, uh, the, the value will be similar in terms of structure, not in terms of uh, error. Because if the error is pixel by pixel, for instance, and uh, if you have your image a little bit disaligned, then the, the error will start to grow. In this case, as are there uh, continuous functions, you will not have these, um, uh, these problems. And that helps you to get uh, a number that is representative of the structure of it. So this is a very interesting research line. Uh, I, from the theoretical point of view of, uh, of information, for information theory, I have a lot of ideas. But again, uh, the, the, the problems here, it's like, picking the, uh, the theoretical uh, model and convert it to something similar to what a telescope observes. This we can do it for you. Yeah, yeah, so but you, you, yeah, you, need, you need the model of the telescope. You, you yeah. In the simulation, you also need to have the model of the telescope. If not, uh, you cannot compare, I think. And, and the other way around, I think, I think it's much more difficult to just pick in the real data and try to regress the model of the telescope, it's, it's more, much more messy, I think. Yes? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question about the availability on this software, because as I understand you right, I can just take this clump finding algorithm and run it over data cubes, each data cube I have, for example. Yeah. Because these are almost all... Um, small ones. Data. Yeah, I'm a data group. So, for example, I can also um, prepare a, a data cube of optical integrated field units and, yeah. well, how far can I push this software, um, this clump finding algorithm, when I'm giving it, for example, a pure emission line spectrum observed, for example, with Manga or Muse? Yeah, uh, I think. I think that the problem with this software, and I haven't, haven't tried because I'm working with all my data, is that uh, it might get confused with a lot of uh, non-resolved uh, uh, data. So if you have a, a, a lot of stars of functional objects or whatever and uh, they're not spread, I think the assumptions that I'm making, I'm making it, they are not the, the good ones. But in terms of size of what you um, can, can put here, um, I think that the key idea here is that the, um, the representation, it does not depend, the size of the representation, the new representation, it does not depend on the size of the image, but on how complex the structure is. So if, if you have things like uh, this disk, it will have a very small representation compared to this one that it's much more complex. It depends on the complexity of what you are doing, the, the size of the last representation. And that's important also because it will also impact on, this, on the time that it, it takes to represent, if you have something is, similar. Is, uh, are these times uh, calculated on your local computer? Yeah, in my local computer, not in the supercomputer and, and nothing else. Okay. Yes. So it, it, it's fast and I haven't reported any other time because the other times are um, uh, the terms of the cl uh, clustering algorithms and all that are basically online. You just run it and give you the result. So um, the representations are very, very compact. If you have something like 300 megabytes, that it's not so huge for um, for cubes, but it's it's a reasonable cube. You can end up with a few kilobytes kilobytes of uh, 
of the compact representation. And you can produce from that a cube, uh, a cube that represents things like this, okay? So this uh, is obtained from the representation that we generate the cube um, of, of a lot of megabytes and then uh, stack them in order to put it in the slide. But um, that's the idea that we're trying here, it might be other ways, but we're just trying to represent the complexity of what is uh, in the image, not the resolution that you have. Yeah, I mean, um, with this algorithm, it would be much faster to search, for example, in um, archives of integrated field units, to search, for example, or when I look around a, sp a certain time of the emission line and search something like an outlier, this emission line and a velocity outlier to find, for example, gas exhaustion in galaxies, and I think this is quite feasible with this. Yeah, ex exa exactly. That's, that's the major that's, point. If yeah. If uh, astronomers are not convinced <laughs> with this kind of representation, you know, I want to work with the raw data, like uh, always, uh, you can also use this as uh, part of a service that only helps you to discover data yeah, which, which can pick yeah. rather than doing analysis. Yeah, great. <laughs> it was too good. Yeah, you, you had another question. Uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, noise correlation. Sorry? Noise is correlated in radio images. If the noise is correlated? Noise is correlated, especially correlated in radio images and natural images. That's, that's why you can't use that sex factor, for example, in radio images. But this is for your question. This is why it would be more complicated to use this with radio data, because the noise has different properties. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. You, because the, um, the, the, the noise here, you, you said it's correlated because the artifacts of the reconstruction. Because radio images of our pixels are correlated with one. What's one? Yeah. It's just like not an optical source like this. So if you compare yeah. your optical map with the Gaussian, maybe you can use it better. <laughs> it's a spatial information. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I a student tried this just with um, uh, infrared uh, emissions and it works fine. Uh, and that's where I saw some problems with um, uh, non resolved uh, uh, data. But actually, you can just remove that. That is, with a PSL, it's easily to detect uh, a non resolved uh, uh, object. So, yeah, this is designed for extended emission. I don't know if we need the noise to be correlated or not. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good question, which is the applicability of this. Uh, I have a question about the, the number of components that you put in the representation. Uh, is it just chosen analytically until you reach a level of fidelity of your representation? Or do you pick it by hand as a user? Or yeah, this is a very good question. Um, we, have, we have one thing that we control and the other thing that we estimate. We, co we could control the size of each bubble in terms of flux. Okay? Because if we want, if we have a lot of time and space to waste, we will do as small as possible each bubble, okay, in order to have more resolution. So that, that has a direct influence on the number of components, right? The size of the bubble. The, the size of the bubble, mm -hmm. and that will impact the number of the components yeah. over there. Mm -hmm. But when we end um, selecting the components, it's basically on this signal to noise ratio estimation. So that's the, the stopping criteria. So you, you, you keep um, um, subtracting, if you want, these, uh, these Gaussians, these little functions, up to the point where um, the signal to noise ratio is uh, uh, in this is estimation point. W and why is this important? Because if you subtract the signal, or signal plus a little bit of noise, uh, this will be a reasonable number of uh, of, of functions, of, of, of points. If you start picking in a, in a cube, if you start uh, going into the noise, just noise, the, the number of, of elements in the representation will explode. 
So that's why you need um, an estimation of the signal to rate. Uh, in the paper, it said, okay, astronomers are very good on, on, on estimating this. But uh, I give this heuristic that we should revisit and we should work a little bit more because it's very simple. Uh, this uh, idea that in some point the, um, the signal starts to mix with the noise and we try to detect this point is just an empirical observation that the derivative of this uh, function has a maximum here. But some, in some point in some data set then you will have another maximum here. So why you should choose this one and not this one? It's the first maximum. Sorry. No, also especially for radio images, the, the noise it's, it, it's not uncorrelated. Yep. So, so it depends on, on the spectral mode and spatial. Or, or if you have a, uh, a, so a, a mosaic. To estimate in Fourier space a, a different uh, wave number. So. Mm. Yeah, and you have some mosaics that have more uh, spectral lines that, uh, sorry, uh, more channels than the other, and you have different places where, yeah. And the other thing that we, we were discussing is um, a good, uh, this also depends a lot on the good estimation of the um, uh, RMS of the noise. And for these images, I've just picked, for these uh, data cubes, I've just picked the RMS of this, the, the whole thing which is a very bad estimation, and that's why uh, you have this bad result here. Well, you cannot see here, but uh, you do not have a very good, uh, it's here? Yeah, no, you cannot see. Um, you do not have a very good residual, okay? And that's basically because uh, the RMS is overestimated. So you need to have a good estimation of RMS and a good estimation of the signal to noise ratio. But for my, my opinion, and that's completely my opinion, uh, that's much more in the uh, astronom astronomy domain that you can understand and set up a good parameter that the things that have Gaussian, uh, the, um, the Gauss clamp algorithm, which is numbers of iterations uh, after something, or a number of fails uh, of the optimization. Things that are not in your domain, it's much more in my domain. So I try to, in this algorithm, to put everything in the domain that you can sense what the parameter is. Okay? So you have here three parameters, which is RMS, a signal to lose ratio, and a lambda parameter, which is the, the, the amount of the, um, the, the flux that have each, uh, each element. So with these three um, values, you can uh, produce different representations. Okay. So my, my technical question actually goes a little to this. Sorry. So but in, in many of our data sets, obviously, this, for even for homogeneous type of sources, the signal to noise and the RMS change on the observation and on the source. Yeah. So one would need a, an algorithm to use it properly that adapts and essentially searches for signal trying to optimize also the, the smoothing of the signal in the spectral domain, for example. Have uh, you looked at this possibility or do you expect this to be done really? the, yeah. yeah, the RMS, uh, there's a lot of ways to do it and I think there are some packages. Do you remember which one? The, the package you told this morning, told me this morning? Well, there are several packages and yeah, but uh, Blobcat also Blobcat, yeah. specific uh, estimation of the uh, no, yes, but uh, yeah, the, point is, the point is whether you can adapt it to well. I think yeah. this is most of the data in order to pick up a signal that is not because... Yeah, this, this, this is... This is, this is more data processing, I mean, pre-processing that, well, you could include in the method. Yes. And at some point, it's probably one part of the pipeline if you want to make another yeah. signal. But you have that's right. No, 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 that's right. If you focus on one data set, on one specific science code, I understand. If you look at the archive perspective, you cannot do that. That kind of perspective, you have to yep. have an automatic way of deciding. That's, uh, that's what, I'm, that's what I, I was uh, talking about here. This is adaptive to each data set. It's, not, it's an heuristic. It's not the best thing that we can do. Uh, I think it would be much better. But uh, here, the signal to noise is estimated from the same data. Uh, just doing a simple uh, thresholding and an iterative algorithm. And yeah, but to answer your question, you can probably decide that if your, if your cut is uh, too low, then you smooth the data 
and then you get something which has a big estimate of the same yeah. terms and exactly. then you the So you use just a meta of uh, having yeah. a Thank you, thank you very much. I would like to add uh, two or three words. Uh, so Mauricio will be here uh, to the end of the week to uh, to uh, work for, for with us for this uh, inside this uh, Minerva project for uh, signal identification and signal representation in data queue for radio astronomy in general. And I'm a particular good candidate for that. Tomorrow we will, uh, we will do a hands-on session at 10 o'clock, uh, Salle du Levant, where I will uh, show his uh, Julien books. So if you have more, if you have more uh, technical questions and want to see uh, how this plays uh, in, in real time, then you're very welcome to come and discuss that. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, Mauricio is uh, here in the Matimora, uh, sixth floor, so we can come and discuss with him up to Friday. And, uh, and that's it, there, there is a newsletter, that, uh, we will use a, a mailing list uh, for the seminars, if you want to register, if you are interested in this type of seminars, uh, please uh, register on this list. And uh, otherwise, thank you very much. Yeah, hey. Well, I just want to add that uh, this is just one part of unsupervised learning. I also work on uh, supervised learning, like traditional things. So if anyone has worked with that, I'm so to discuss on any learning thing. <laughs>